Thank you very much, Karen Deep, for that introduction. Um, my, the title of my talk, as you can see there, is Rethinking ID Detection, Disposal and Training. Uh, just a quick introduction. Um, I'm now an in independent consultant after several years in defence force development and, as you've heard, the counter ID training. Uh, I've had the opportunity to work in the UK, clearly, uh, Australia, the US, Africa and Asia. Uh, and what I'd like to do is just impart some of my observations uh, have, uh, have obs I've looked at how various other countries deal with the ID threat. I'd just like to add, these, uh, these thoughts are not the, uh, the views of my former employers, so I get a chance to speak my mind for change because I'm now independent. Um, and the aim of this is to really, is just to, to promote some sort of discussion um, uh, at the end of the, uh, uh, the presentation. Throughout this presentation, I'm looking at Asia in the round. I can't give the issue real justice within the time frame, but I'll give it my best shot. So please forgive me if I don't dive into too much detail. So, as we've heard throughout yesterday and today, um, counter ID uh, and the ID threat is a worldwide problem. Over a 20 month period from August 2010 through to August 2012, the US Joint Improvised Explosive Device Defeat Organization, JIDO as it's more commonly called, found the global improvised explosive device casualties reached their peak in May 2012 with approximately 1,800 people wounded and nearly 600 killed in that month alone. In Asia, improvised explosive device attacks have doubled since 2006 and will remain uh, a, a part as it continues to fight, as Asia continues to fight a painfully slow but successfully, uh, successful small wars against insurgencies and crime. David Galula noted that low intensity conflict has been more common throughout this, the history of warfare than has conflict between nations represented by armies on a conventional field of battle. Small wars are here to stay. A closer analysis would indicate that it is more accurate to speak of the spread or, or expansion of the sphere of the improvised explosive device rather than any dramatic shift. Indeed, as terrorists <clears throat> and their state sponsors secure even limited successes in one region, the methods are adopted in others, threatening an ever-widening spectrum of nations and cultures. It is now increasingly clear that no nation in the world is entirely free of the threat from attack from the improvised explosive device. <clears throat> Let's focus on Asia uh, and use India as an example. The ID device is increasingly the weapon of choice for terrorists and criminals in Asia and therefore becoming the domestic security challenge of the foreseeable future. The ID threat from homegrown extreme, extremism and out of, outside forces has developed over time and now has reached a level of sophistication within India that equals that witnessed globally. I'd just like to draw your attention to the graph that you can see there. That's uh, a representation of the number of casualties, uh, uh, both wounded and fatalities, um, since 2003. And as we heard yesterday, we've heard about the reduction in, uh, in attacks. You'll note some of the numbers there. You can see there's a peak in 2008 of around 400 people. But let's put that into context. About 400 people die a year in the roads in New Delhi. That's acceptable by society. People accept those casualties. However, society does not accept the casualties created by IEDs because they, they, they foresee them as being preventable. Similar issues are experienced by Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, etc., just to name a few. The use of increasingly sophisticated IED technologies and adaptive tactics, techniques, and procedures provides the terrorist networks with an extremely cost-effective means to deliver a devastating effect. The IED will therefore remain a key element of the Asian internal security environment. Can a different problem set, set be exploited and make useful recommendations for how Asia might seek some answers to support security challenges? The remainder of this presentation will explore this idea and make some suggestions. As I've said before, these are thoughts and ideas formulated by years working within the counter-ID industry, as it's termed. And for the first time, I can express my thoughts without prejudice or commercial pressures, having no longer working for a major technology company. First, a health warning. Caution should be taken in, dire in directly exporting the innovations and lessons from the West War into the Asian homeland security environment. First. The underlying security issues in wider Asia are not as similar as those in Afghanistan and Iraq as the West's defense and security industry would like you to believe. In some way, the challenges are more complex and difficult to, fight, to define. One might argue that Afghanistan is more opaque than Asia. 
The Taliban are attacking the West. However, in wider Asia, the causal factors or tensions are far more, far more nuanced and intermixed. Secondly, the comparative sum of money that the West has spent against IEDs is huge. NATO has provided a substantial economic resource from the West combined war chest and made it available to buy the best new thinking and equipment. However, most agree that this strategy has not worked as well as it should have. The Asian Security Organization is more diverse and until now lacked the funding to have any true impact on innovation. And thirdly, the wider Asian challenge and that of Afghanistan and Iraq differ by cultural organization. Put bluntly, the type of person you would employ for internal security is not the same as the one you would employ for external security. Wars are fought by soldiers and peace is kept by the police and the population. Soldiers and policemen think very differently about issues and these cultural differences are often negated when integrating innovation from the battlefield into the streets. However, what is clear is that the IED's um, equipment, chemistry, tactics, procedures and initiation systems are coalescing globally. Disaffected actors seem to now use similar IED techniques. Best practice is rapidly communicated using the internet and modern communications. What has worked well on the battlefield has migrated into the city streets. The recent attacks in Boston or Bangalore would have been finessed in Chechnya or Afghanistan. The IED threat is undergoing a change, but could this be an opportunity? Can Asia's homeland security network migrate some important lessons from the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan and leverage some of NATO's experience? Can a sharing of ideas lead to an advantage of the insurgent and the criminal? I believe this is so, and here are some of my thoughts. Are there any Americans in the audience? I can't. Okay, I'm not picking on any Americans specifically, but if you just, just draw your attention to that video, you can see a US Marine Corps patrol moving through Sangin in 2009. And if you look there, you can see a rock. Just with that guy stepping, now behind that wall, there's a device. They're looking for a specific kind of threat. They're looking for a pressure plate and, a, if you like, a, a mine uh, on, uh, underneath. They're using particular tactics. I don't know about you, but if, have you ever followed a, in a line of 40 people? Um, if the guy at the front's got a, a metal detector, trying to keep his uh, exact footprints is a little bit difficult. And you can also see here they're very close together. If something went off, that's going to have a significant impact against that patrol. So you see they've completely missed the device. Bang. The device itself was a uh, pressure cooker bomb. And I'll talk about that in a bit more detail later. Fortunately, in this incident, it didn't fully initiate. It was a simple pressure, uh, uh, pressure cooker bomb initiated by kite wire. Very, very simple. As I say, it partly functioned. Unfortunately, the marine that was caught in the blast just had a bit of a bloody nose. So, if it works in the battlefield, why change it? In India, terror, the terror group Lashkar-e-Taiba used pressure cookers to kill 200 people in the Mumbai train blast on July the 7th, 2007. They placed seven pressure cookers in local train compartments to target peak hour traffic. The Indian Mujahideen used the pressure cooker bomb in Varansai, the Varansai blast in 2006, and killed seven people. They don't raise any suspicion, and they're readily available. They're lethal, as the shrapnel st stuffed in them can inflict immense injuries because of the pressure. These bombs have been used by many terror outfits, including the Al-Qaeda, who have also uh, had a detailed tutorial in 2010 on the issue on its own online magazine on how the pressurized cooker is the most effective method for making the simple bomb, and you can see that that, example, that um, presentation there. There have been pressure cooker bombings in Pakistan and Afghanistan also, and a pressure cooker was one of the three devices used in the attempted bombing in Tem uh, Times Square, New York, in May 2010, and clearly the, bo the recent Boston bombings. I love showing that, that clip uh, in the front to some of my um, former British Army colleagues. Um, the simple pen knife as a uh, disruptor mechanism on the, uh, on the device there, um, uh, you should see the, 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 the faces turn white. But it works. A pen knife can remove that threat. Then moving on, a different type of threat. This is the Maoist ambush in the, on the Sukhma Jad, uh, Jagdalpur Highway. Uh, you can see it's a slightly different uh, mode of attack there. 
Um, it's an adaption of a, uh, some form of military mine or explosive on a roadside attack. Um, we've seen this type of attack in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, and we've seen it mainly honed in the Helmand province um, of Afghanistan. This particular attack was no different. They used the ID to best effect to constrain the convoy and then conducted a uh, complex attack. And you can see that that vehicle's been shifted uh, a, number of, a number of meters. No, no vehicle in the world is going to survive that, that form of blast. You're not going to walk out of that vehicle. Taking that further, an even more recent example, you can see here uh, we're in Syria now. This is the vantage point of uh, the Free Syrian Army conducting an attack against a Syrian ambush, sorry, a Syrian uh, uh, army uh, convoy. You can see the lead vehicles coming around a bend. The guy who's actually videoing this is talking in the background, and he's saying, get, get ready, get ready, uh, they're in, they're in Lenau, and you, they're using the pylon as a marker to make sure they're in the right place. They place something on the road, the vehicle stopped, and the rest of the convoy follows up behind. And at the right moment, someone gets out of the vehicle, tries to shift whatever is in the road blocking the path. Homemade explosives. I think it's a uh, BPM, uh, some sort of uh, Russian uh, BMP vehicle. That's not going to um, deal with that kind of blast. So we've had a look at the expanding uh, sphere, and yes, it is a challenge, but what can be done about it? Here's a few ideas that I have come up with over my time. I think the key thing to my approach is there is no single idea. It needs to be a blended approach depending on the different problems at the different time. And I've called it my golf bag of ideas, and it needs to span all the way from the system equipment end all the way up through um, the, the, the various um, uh, levels up until the, up towards the international strategy, uh, uh, society. So I'll start at the system level. Um, the hardest one lesson by, lesson by NATO has been that a, a dependency on equipment will not provide that silver bullet so often hoped for. In Afghanistan and Iraq, Western defense initially dealt with a developing IED problem using a method that had worked well in previous war conflicts mainly the Cold War, and that was technological superiority. As an example, approximately 50% of the UK's operational equipment budget, which is nearly two billion pounds, has been attributed to the counter-ID vehicle and equipment process. This initial rush to bring to bear new equipment is understandable. In terms of practicality, equipment is relatively easy to implement and force change. Politically, it demonstrates that decision makers are taking the issue seriously by apportioning some form of budget resource. <clears throat> Finally, as a placebo, it gives the user community a new weapon or tool to defeat the threat. However, it has been suggested that initially the coalition was slow to follow up these new innovations with supporting training, tactics, and education. Only once this was addressed did the casualty rates begin to decrease as devices were increasingly detected and the perpetrators' networks were diminished through increased intelligence and precision strikes. Secondly, but most importantly, as soon as a successful counter-ID technology was fielded and it is successful, the insurgent will completely change his modus operandi and the years of investment and innovation will be made obsolete within weeks. So, my point is, equipment is not the sole answer. We need to look at the entire counter-ID capability. Um, over my time, I've seen some weird and wacky equipment. The, uh, the thing at the top there was, uh, uh, it's a ground penetrating radar uh, on a robot. And I was at a demonstration in America where they were showing this off. And one of the uh, marine privates piped up and said, do you not need to move it left and right to make it work? And the engineers had completely forgotten about it. Uh, the system at the bottom there um, basically fires an electrical pulse into the road and um, sets off through electrical charge a series of devices. What you can't see are the 15 fuel trucks that have to go behind it to make the generator work at the front to create that form of charge. A lot of money's been um, put into uh, equipment, um, but is that the most cost-effective way of doing it? I don't think so. Perhaps a more effective means of um, increasing counter-ID effectiveness is an investment in groups and people. And mainly you can achieve that through focusing on tactics and procedures. In essence, tactics and procedures are the trellis on which junior commanders, police personnel, and security staff can innovate and deal with a wide range of issues associated with IEDs. This diagram uh, shows the impacts of each capability, capability slice on counter-ID effectiveness. At least 10% of any successful activity is due to luck. 
There are elements within the complex counter-ID system that no one can predict or counter. The chance observation or the anonymous tip-off are, are an important factor, but is uncontrollable. As previously mentioned, equipment or technology has been a prime focus, and yet it estimates that it accounts for approximately only 30% of the overall effect. And yet tactics and procedures, i.e. effective and proven doctrine, effective individual and collective training, and good leadership accounts for 60% of the impact. A simple review of the way in which the security infrastructure conducts its counter-ID business may be a cost-effective means of significantly enhancing countermeasures. Modify a tactic or enhancing training may even have a bigger effect. The lesson here is to focus on things that make a demonstrable return on investment before the distraction of technology. Prepare to meet a range of possible scenarios and ensure your people are learn by making mistakes. So, following on from that, can you build a security organization to rebound from attack and actually get stronger as a result? A great deal has been done by many countries on developing country ID organizations, each with their own distinctive approach and brand. But what singles out the most successful organizations? The answer comes from an unusual source, through the Lebanese-American essayist and scholar whose work focuses on problems of randomness, probability, and uncertainty. In his new book, um, Anti-Fragile, a chap called Nassim Nicholas Talib, as you can see his book there on the slide, argues that we need to have more disorder, chaos, and stress in our daily lives to test our institutions, governments, and business. Some things just like vol vol uh, um, volatility, and some things just hate it. As you can see in the diagram there, things that are fragile tend to break under pressure. Things that are robust can deal with that pressure, but you're not going to beat that force or that stress that you're dealing with. If you're anti-fragile, you thrive under pressure. More significantly, I aim to introduce a new concept that believes that, that we believe has been absent from our discussions of early uh, human endeavor. As I mentioned, this is called anti-fragility. -fragil Fragile things, such as a crystal champagne flute, or for instance, or a house of cards, are hurt by stress, randomness, and uncertainty. Anti-fragile things, however, are strengthened by it. Just as a hydra grows stronger and are more multi-headed with every decapitation. Taleb maintains that living things in complex systems are all anti-fragile to some degree. Our bodies, for the most part, thrive as a result of regular interaction with stresses in the environment just as firms become weak during long periods of steady prosperity, devoid of setbacks, and small forest fires periodically cleanse the system of the most flammable material. So, by adopting practices that make our lives and institutions more anti-fragile, can we better negotiate a world that is in so many ways inherently unpredictable, particularly represented by complex ID attacks? To a degree, the more successful organizations I've worked with have adapted an anti-fragile uh, approach. They just didn't realize it. They felt that they were being agile, robust, and a learning organization. But Talib describes this eloquently through his anti-fragile term. So select and train your organization to be more anti-fragile. And to follow through from yesterday's discussion, instead of fight a gorilla like a gorilla, you need to fight a gorilla better than a gorilla. Next, society. Taking this even further, how about the wider society as a key element of any security infrastructure? The ordinary individual citizen, too, must be acting in concert with the authorities. The passenger who kicks up a fuss when he's frisked at an airport, <clears throat> the house owner who insists that be, by being advised to inform on his neighborhood police station about the new tenant is an intrusion into his private affairs, such individuals un unwittingly help terrorism. On the one hand, the terrorist has an easier time establishing the safe house from which he can carry out the next explosion, on the other, the average policeman is discouraged, discouraged from doing his assigned duty. But as exemplified in the US after the Boston attack, society can become an integral support ingredient in the post-attack follow-up. Or indeed, after the Woolwich attacks, the ordinary people have the part to play. How can this be encouraged, and what can be done to win the battle of the narratives so that the people, instead of being just a stakeholder, the people are the stakeholder? And finally, I would like to emphasize the minister's point on partnerships. You need to generate and create your own self-forming networks of communities of interest. The terrorist is maximizing a network of focused individuals into collection action, collected action. But why can't we do the same? The West is actively seeking engagement and discussions with the international community and industry. The seeking acceptance of assistance is not a weakness. Today, IDs are a shared problem, and it is in the interest to communicate Within the last three years, there's been a concerted effort by the West 
for increased international security cooperation and sharing of ideas. The increased fre frequency and popularity of international networking events such as this one, Security Watch UK, demonstrate this growing emphasis of international security cooperation. And finally, a lesson from my European colleagues. One thing is clear. Asia is becoming a significantly, significant international partner in the advan advancements, advancements to the advancement of counter-ID capabilities as the West attempts to rebalance its military effort and extract from the small wars. An example of this is that India is increasing its spending on homeland defense and counter-ID capabilities. India's homeland security market is expected to be worth around 16 billion US dollars by 2018. Around 6% of global procurement in the field of homeland security is anticipated to come from India by 2020. Asia will continue to develop its own counter-ID strategy bespoke innovation and responses and to engage, engage with other international and industry partners to ensure that it is fully prepared for this expanding threat. I predict that Asia, and in particular India, will be a key partner in the international campaign against IDs in the future. We, at this time of inflection in the West, need to consider how we might better learn from Asia's example in their increasing knowledge of countering the ID challenge. Thank you for your time. Uh, there's my contact details if you wish to continue the discussion offline, but I'd like to hand back to Karen Deep for the discussion.